Hey everyone, welcome back to the lab. In this video, we're gonna be talking about how this developer's side project racked up a $100,000 cloud bill on Netlify and five ways to avoid the same fate with your own project. So on February 16th of 2024, a developer was happily going about their life. They built a small static site as a side project four years ago and had hosted it for free on Netlify since then. Netlify is a pretty popular fully managed cloud service, one of those newer shiny like serverless ones, which we'll get into later. It got some traffic, around 200 daily visitors, but the monthly traffic and bandwidth fell squarely in the free tier. They were serving about 10 gigabytes of bandwidth per month, um, egress and Netlify typically allows up to 100 gigabytes in their in their free plan, which is like pretty common around clouds to have like a, a, a free plan. But everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked, uh, uh, sorry, when the developer received their monthly bill for $104,500. So they went from free for four years to $100,000 monthly bill. In this post, we're gonna explore what happened and how to prevent it so that your side projects don't financially ruin you. Because, you know, for me, at least a $100,000 bill would, you know, be financially ruinous for my life. All right, so first let's talk about the static site that they were building and kind of what it did. So basically, it seems to be some sort of like directory or blog that has links to some sort of music files. You can kind of think of it as like maybe a little bit of like a SoundCloud kind of thing. Uh, maybe one of those like EDM train blogs that's like blog posts and then there's a sound file so you can kind of listen to it. It's something like that. The specifics aren't too important here, but what is important is that some of these audio files might be kind of big because, you know, audio like video um, actually is relatively large compared to, let's say, like an image and definitely compared to like a static only text site like mine is. So it's a simple static site, you know, it's getting some traffic regularly, you know, serving about 10 gigabytes of bandwidth per month. Um, but for the past four years, you know, it was free. It was always in that Netlify free tier because the free tier, you know, at time of writing gives about 100 gigabytes a month of data egress. All right, now let's talk about this $100,000 bill. So the site seems to have been targeted by some sort of DDoS and DDoS stands for a distributed denial of service attack. Obviously there's like DOS, DDoS, which one is it? Nobody actually cares, it's basically the same. Um, and this is basically when a ton of fake traffic is sent to a site or service, which ends up overloading its systems in some way. Doesn't always end up overloading it, but obviously with this much traffic, like it's gonna do something. And so, this DDoS seems to have targeted a single 3.44 megabyte audio file and downloaded it like a lot. My estimates are that it was downloaded maybe 55 million times. This is assuming that, you know, everything is only egress cost, that they only targeted this one file. Um, but somehow a file of this size is basically equivalent to this file being downloaded 55 million times uh, in this month. And so when you look at this bill, basically it was $104,500. If we assume all of this was egress, which is probably not true, there's probably some costs for just like uh, serving the requests and some sort of ingress and stuff like that. But you know, we can basically assume it was mostly data egress. Then they probably served about 190 terabytes, um, which is quite large, especially coming from, you know, their 10 gigabytes per month before that. Um, and I got this basically by just looking at their 55 gigabyte per 100 gigabyte bandwidth. Um, and this is, this is my rough math. And the peak day was on um, February 16th, where they transferred close to 61 terabytes, which itself cost about $33,000 just on this one day. Now we don't know exactly what this DDoS's goal was, um, but they are relatively common out in the wild on the internet. The internet's kind of like the wild, wild west. People can connect to it and do whatever. That's both a pro and a con, but we can kind of like draw some common patterns out of it. And usually the goal of an attack like this is to bring down a site so it can't work appropriately. So um, the way it basically works is like, you know, if there's a really popular event, let's say like a Taylor Swift concert is going to happen in a few months and there's like on Friday at 9 a.m. we're gonna release tickets. You know when you go to that site at 9 a.m., it's gonna be buggy. And the reason it's gonna be buggy and it might crash a lot and it's gonna be super laggy and slow and feel bad is because there's so many people hitting this site at the one time that they're basically DDoSing it. Um, and this is because, you know, the servers, they're overloaded, they can't handle all this traffic, they're not used to this all at once. 
And this is basically what DDoS does, except it's not real people for the most part. It's going to be machines that are producing fake people or fake usage on this thing. But it still has the same effect where it starts to like crash these machines. Um, so it makes the site unusable or um, just very bad. Now, this is how it used to happen um, because we had these kind of set machines. But things have changed a little bit in the past like decade or so. And that's that we're kind of in this land of infinite serverless scale. And so I kind of told you that Netlify is kind of like this new age, shiny, super easy to use serverless-ish um, cloud host. And this comes with it, this idea that your thing can scale infinitely. And so an attack like this theoretically won't have that same effect because your site will scale infinitely. So it probably won't cause your site to, to fail, assuming it's a static site. Now, if you have shared resources like a database, yes, it probably will. But the effect might actually be worse. And the reason this is, is because we've now created an ability to rack up an infinite cloud bill that instead of ruining the site and making it unusable for some period of time for the users, like that's bad, we lose sales. It might actually rack up a bill so high that it ruins the entity behind it so that they don't last past those few days, which, you know, if you're running a side project and you get a hundred thousand dollar bill, that's probably going to ruin you too. And so I think this is why it's really important for us, people who are building side projects to think about this because this could, you know, stop your side projects going in the future. And so, you know, this happened to the developer and they were rightfully flustered and scared. You know, this is a financially ruinous amount of money. It's costing more than most people make an entire year. And it's all for something that they just built for fun four years ago. And it was just on the internet for people to enjoy. And all of a sudden it's ruining them. And so they started reaching out to support and making posts to get advice. And the Netlify billing team did get back to them. And this is basically what they said. So they confirmed that it was a DDoS. And so their policy is to reach out when, when they confirm this and to try to lower the bill. Now, the reasons they can lower the bill, we'll talk about later, um, but the idea is that their policy is to lower the bill. Now, usually they cut the bill to 20% of its cost, which means it would cost $20,000 in this case. So this is the deal they give to most developers. But they said they're willing to make an exception in this case because the bill is so high. And so they're willing to lower it to 5%, which is $5,000. Now, I want to point out that $5,000 is certainly a lot better than $100,000. And most cloud services probably will not give you this deal. 5% actually seems like a pretty good deal on the surface. Um, of course, we'll talk about how good that deal is a little bit later. But in context, for a side project created four years ago that's always been on a free tier that you haven't touched in a while, this is still kind of an unreasonable amount, especially when consider it's just a static site which, you know, when you think about it, it should be basically free. And for reference, you know, I host my static sites for about a dollar per month and I get more traffic than this person does. Obviously I'm not serving these like giant, you know, audio files, but still get, get the same amount of traffic, more traffic, and it costs me about a dollar per month. So when we think static site, that's what we should be thinking. And then I have all sorts of other projects, dozens that I'm currently running that in total cost me a about $100 per year, give or take a little bit. And so even $5,000, that's actually quite a lot. I would have to, you know, 50x my my traffic, my projects, etc., to reach that amount of runway. So for a side project like this, 5k is still significant and probably too much. Now I do want to give Netlify um, some credit. The CEO did reach out on Hacker News and they ended up waiving the bill altogether. But I do want to point out that, you know, we should not expect expect this to be the norm. We should actually expect this kind of waiving the bill to be an edge case. And so when we think about preventing this for ourselves, we can't rely on the CEO reaching out and swooping in and saving us because it probably won't happen. Basically, if your DDoS doesn't reach the front page of Reddit or Hacker News like this one did, then it's unlikely you're going to get anything but that standard 20% discount, which they, you know, offered here as, as part of their policy. But I think even further, we should consider that this is not necessarily something they have to do or will do in the future. And so we shouldn't even rely on the 20% policy. It's possible you will get stuck with the 100% bill. And on many cloud platforms, you will end up getting stuck with a 100% bill. Okay, so with all that said, how do we keep our side projects from financially ruining us? How do we prevent this $100,000 bill? Well, the main problem with this particular side project is that it had unbounded financial downside. 
It was possible, you know, as we saw here, for the build to grow infinitely without any comparable upside. This is basically the case for most side projects. They don't make money, so more traffic leads to more expense. And this is in contrast to like, let's say a business website um, or service that you're building, let's say at your job or something, where the idea is the more traffic actually leads to more money in some way, whether it's like ads or more purchases or something like that. And so in that case, you know, you might wanna be ready for all the traffic on, let's say Black Friday or the Super Bowl or whatever it is, because this will lead you to more money. And so the upside and the downside, they, you know, kind of grow proportionally. But for the side projects, which is like a hobby, it's just an expense, really. Um, we really need to protect the downside because the upside cannot save us. And so here's some ways that I put together that we can set up our side projects to kind of avoid this financial ruin. We can avoid this unbounded downside. So the first thing we can do is we can set a spend limit. And this will work because it will cap our expenses. It will cap our downsides. And this is going to allow us to basically say, let's set $100 per month as the most we're willing to spend on this project. It's just a dumb project. I did it for fun. It should never cost me more than $100 because if it does, that's ridiculous. It's not worth it to me. And you could do that like on your, a given project or maybe a group of projects that are just for fun. That's like, you know, none of these should cost me more than that. And the way this works in most cloud platforms is that, you know, once your expenses have hit that limit, the service or the group of projects will just shut down. They'll just stop serving traffic. And so they'll, you know, be returning 500s or like 404 is not found or whatever it is. And, you know, obviously this is not ideal in all cases. Like if this is a business, then you probably don't want to do this because you know, you're losing the traffic, which leads to your upside. And so yes, you're saving downside, but you're losing upside. But even in a business case where you want that upside, you don't want to lose those customers, DDoS might actually be preferable to uncapped expenses. So if that traffic is not actually real people that will bring upside, then there's just pure downside and you don't want to have that happen. And so for side projects, which typically aren't profitable, this is basically what you want to do for everything. You know, you're not getting any upside. It's clear that if this happens, this is out of bounds for what it's worth it for you. You don't want to spend more than $100 per month, you know, set the limit. A few lost days of availability is probably worth avoiding financial ruin because, you know, this just, you know, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Now, I do want to note that, you know, most cloud platforms offer this in some way. It might not be at the project level. Sometimes it's at the account level, but they usually offer this in some way. I will say that at time of writing, it appears Netlify does not offer this capability. And so maybe you should avoid it for now until they actually build it. The next thing we can do is basically set our max resources, which again is capping our expenses because it's capping the amount of money we will will use the amount of usage we have at any one given time. And so another way to manage your expenses is to put bounds on the resources you use. Without doing this, it's possible for you to get DDoS your infra to scale automatically and you hit your $100 cap in 10 minutes. This is because, you know, these kind of infinite scale things will literally scale infinitely. And so let's say it's like a dollar per machine per minute or whatever, which is like high, but let's just pretend. Um, and I have my $100 cap. If you send me infinite amounts of traffic, my thing will scale infinitely. And then, you know, one minute, it'll spin up 100 machines. And then in one minute, I'm done. My, my thing's capped, it'll, it'll turn off. But it's like pretty clear from the outside. It's like, I didn't want to serve, you know, spend all my money in one minute. That seems like a dumb way to use my resources. And so this is what we're doing here is we're adding some constraints to what those auto scalers do so they don't do the dumb thing. And so if you have an idea of what your software needs to do and the kind of traffic it will receive, you can actually constrain it a bit to weather such a storm better. Like if I have this stupid static site, that's a side project. Maybe I'm like, it deserves one machine. Don't ever scale over one machine. That's like crazy, stupid. Like it, it just doesn't need more than one machine. And so, you know, as an example, you set your site to only run on a max of three small machines. This gives you plenty of availability. It scales to quite a lot. Machines are very powerful these days. And so this is a way of saying like, you know, there should only be one machine, but let's say it gets a spike of traffic. Let's give it three machines. And so, you know, when it sends me this infinite traffic, you know, my machines can't handle everything but it is only going to cost me that like three dollars per minute let's say and so it can last much longer and you know the truth is usually these ddoses like they happen in spikes because there's usually some automated systems that will start to recognize them as ddos and so this idea of we just need to survive the ddos for some amount of time and then it should go away because systems should learn from this um, is actually a pretty decent way to weather the storm because as we'll talk about you can't actually prevent ddos totally but there's ways to kind of prevent their, their impact. And, you know, the main pushback I get when I kind of recommend this is that people are worried about not being able to scale up for customers' traffic spikes, which 
if you're a business and you have upside and this is real traffic makes sense but this in practice is almost never true and so this you're kind of solving for a non-existent issue when you really should be focused on saving against the very real risk of unbounded expenses and the reason it's never true is because like you're probably not amazon um and you probably know from experience if you have spiky traffic and this will be like ticketing events or things like this that like obviously have spikes and this is will show up in your historical data if you're just like a random site you might get a spike maybe because like some video goes viral but it will only last a few days and it's really not the end of the world if like it's slow because if people really want your thing they'll just come back and so a lot of people i think optimize for this like potential risk that doesn't actually happen and basically most domains or businesses or system so not something worth optimizing for all right the next thing you can do is you can set up ddos protection which will prevent most attacks so many cloud services have built-in ddos protection but clearly it doesn't always work as we've seen here netlify says they have built-in ddos protection didn't work. Moreover, I think we have to acknowledge that the incentives of a cloud host and the incentives of the user may not always align. And so poor DDoS protection may be a feature, not a bug. And so let's think about this. I always like following the money for figuring out incentives because usually this is how things end up settling in the real world. And so we think about it this way. So users are going to pay the cloud for usage. And so the cloud wants people to use their stuff more. Now DDoS spikes usage super high because it forces it to, you know, do that infinite scaling, spin up way more usage than is actually necessary for this, this thing. And so if we follow the money, the cloud makes more money off users due to DDoS. And now I want to be clear that I'm not casting blame or saying that, you know, any cloud host is maliciously causing DDoS. I'm just pointing out that the incentives for them to fix this may not be particularly strong. And so so there may be some willful ignorance or deprioritization at play causing these things not to get fixed in a timely manner. And so to protect yourself from this, you basically need to reach for an option where the incentives to protect you, the customer from DDoS, aligns with your own. And what this typically means is reaching for a service like Cloudflare that specializes in protecting against DDoS and they make money from selling you that service. And this aligns incentives because if they fail to protect you, then you're gonna stop paying them to use it. You're gonna tell all the other people that are using it that they should stop using it. And so they actually want to protect you. And you might be like, well, this is the same for all cloud hosts. And it's like, yes, but only when they get sufficient bad press through Reddit and Hacker News. Now, if people are giving Cloudflare bad reviews because of DDoS, then it's like, well, that's the only thing I hired you for, so I'm done. But if people are giving like Google Cloud or Netlify, et cetera, bad reviews for DDoS, people are like, oh, but maybe they're still more useful. DDoS won't happen to me. I'm hiring you for something else, not DDoS. And so I think that's why the, the feedback loop for something that makes money off of this one service is actually probably better and more aligned for you than one that's packaging a lot of other benefits. Now I will say that this one takes a little bit more effort than the above step, uh, steps, but it is well worth it once you get a site with more traffic, visibility, and or dangerous use cases. So like if you're doing large file downloads. And so I don't set up Cloudflare on all my sites um, because I do set up limits and in, in terms of like how much I'm willing to spend, how much resources will happen. So if someone DDoSes me and they use the max resources, it's really not a big deal. But if I were to get one that is pretty highly trafficked and has more visibility, maybe it's more prone to attack for whatever reason, um, maybe it is serving super big downloads and that's part of it, then, then it's definitely worth, I think, taking this extra step to protect yourself. Okay, the next thing to consider is to move to cheaper hosting with better features. And so we've already talked about how Netlify was clearly missing some key capabilities that could have prevented this, namely good DDoS protection, spending limits, and resource limits. But another lever we can pull is to choose a cloud host that provides the same resources for less money. This means our $100 spend limit can go much further, serving 10x more traffic or maybe even 50x. Or by that same token, we could say our $100 hundred thousand dollar bill for some resources could be reduced by 50 times. And so I personally run my sites on Google Cloud Run for the past several years and generally have a good experience. You know, they have this ability to max resources. They have this ability to cap how much you spend. It's pretty easy. But I've also been researching other cloud hosting options and discovered that I could basically get the same serverless container experience with the same amount of compute, the same amount of RAM, et cetera, for about half the cost on DigitalOcean. And so this idea of cloud host shopping, you know, shopping around for, for better deals for the same amount of power has has been top of mind for me. Now, Netlify is one of those new and shiny, we manage everything serverless options. And this can make it easier to get started, but almost always comes with an exorbitant convenience cost 
baked in. And so for example, if we look at data egress costs, you know, via Git deploying, which allows you to kind of compare a lot of costs all in kind of one table, and data egress is, you know, the bandwidth we were talking about earlier that basically costs the side project $100,000. We can see that, you know, Netlify costs about $550 per terabyte. For that same terabyte of egress, Google Cloud cost $111. So this is one fifth the price for the same thing. On DigitalOcean, this costs $10 per terabyte, which is 1 50th the price for the same thing. And basically what this means is if we ran the same site that got DDoSed here and had the $100,000 bill on DigitalOcean, this DDoS bill would have shrunk from $100,000 to $2,000. And that's if we had done nothing to prevent it. And so clearly, if you just pick a different cloud host that has better costs for what you're getting, you can really lower the ceiling on what's possible um, from attacks like this. All right, and finally, your last resort is to just write about it and share about it online. You know, the truth is that DDoS will likely never be fully preventable. It's basically a game of cat and mouse. The cloud host services get better at defending against it, and then the attackers find new ways to circumvent these protections. It's very much like security, very much like fighting fraud, etc. This means that there will always be possible ways to DDoS your site, no matter what you do. You've just got to set yourself up so you're okay when it does eventually happen. Now, if this does happen to you and all of these protections end up failing and you're stuck with a ruinous bill, the next thing you can and should do is Hail Mary by making a public post about it, which is what this developer did. And they got a lot of traction, a lot of press about this. And so this ended up working out for them in the end. Now, I want to make it clear and emphasize that this is not a guaranteed win. In fact, I would argue that this actually rarely works, but it is a chance. And long-term, this is how you create change in the world so it doesn't happen again. And basically the clear outcomes of like writing about this and sharing it online is that one, you get a chance to get a discount as we saw here. Two, you get a chance to improve the service. Um, so it doesn't happen to you again and similar services so that they can all pressure each other to get better at this thing. The next one is you get it useful feedback and tips from other devs on like how they're preventing this stuff. So again, it doesn't happen to you. It doesn't happen to others, et cetera. And largely it just helps the entire industry to learn and grow from this um, so that more people aren't in this terrible situation. And the truth is like doing this actually has a pretty decent chance of getting a lot of pressure to, to help you um, because software engineers have a lot of buying power when it comes to technology. And so they can kind of steer their org and that's like the business wallets, if you will, on what to spend money on. And situations like this, like no software engineer wants to be stuck with a bill like this, both in their own personal projects, but also, you know, at work. And so it's very likely that a story like this is going to get a lot of support and pushback on the companies that are at fault as we saw here. And so if this does happen to you, I really think you should share about it, make a post about it, and it might not save you, but it will save others and likely make a change. And once that happens, you'll probably get a decent amount of support to at least get a percent discount. Next. So this is a very interesting and scary story for me. I run dozens of side projects and build several new ones each year. The idea that one of these projects that I built years ago could come back to financially ruin me and seriously affect my future is devastating. It's enough to make you not want to build side projects, which is, you know, one of my favorite things to do. Luckily, there are some relatively easy ways to avoid such an outcome. They require some extra work, but the bad outcomes they prevent are, well, worth it. Now, personally, I've removed all my sites from Netlify. I just did it this morning when I was looking through this and kind of understanding the implications of it. And it seems like a lot of other software engineers are too um, in the comments. I really think Netlify needs to get their shit together and none of my side projects are worth a $100,000 bill. So until they have controls that will make it impossible for that to happen, it's not worth running any of my stuff on there. That said, I don't think Netlify is the only one to get that should get the blame in this. They're just kind of like the example, if you will. I think many other platforms, especially these newer, shinier, serverless, infinite auto scaling ones all have similar problems and they need to learn from this and change um, or else developers shouldn't use them. But I'm sure this will be a wake up call for them and the industry at large that this really just isn't acceptable. So if you want references, here's the original Reddit post here and the Hacker News post. Um, both of them have like really interesting comments about other people's experiences with this, how they're protecting against it. Um, if you like this post, you might also like how I host my server side rendered F sharp site on Google Cloud for less than a dollar per month. You might also be interested in the Hamstack, a simple scalable tech stack for building modern web apps fast and cheap. And this is basically how I'm building everything uh, this year. And you might also be interested in Instagram's tech stack will surprise you. The surprising tech stack that basically Meta, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp is using at planet scale um, that really breaks a lot of conventions that people consider best practice in the industry. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.